the shooting range. In this episode, how Marcel Dassault made France great again with the help of a mysterious upgrade to its own Uragan. Are you feeling the hype for the glorious Type 90? Let's see how you can prepare for its arrival. Hotline. The developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with the perfect vehicles for those who like it hard. Tips and tricks for fighting on gun trucks. When it comes to mixed battles, players prefer to use tanks most of the time. They've got everything. Some speed, armor, powerful guns. But sometimes you just want to spice it up a little, you know, to do something unusual. What if we get rid of the armor? No need for a turret. No need for tracks. Strap on some wheels, get an even bigger gun, and there you have it. Gun trucks. There are quite a few of those in the game, but we'll be speaking about two of them that we like the most. Obviously, they were built to fight enemy aircraft, but let's be honest, guns of this caliber can deal with even the most well-protected ground targets as well. Please welcome the 29K and the Flak 37... Flak 37 Selb... Selb... Oh, damn it. Why does it have to be this way? The Flak 37 SFL. Both of these so-called SPAAGs are basically just guns on wheels. They have next to no armor. The German vehicle is built around the famous 88mm Flak 37. The Soviet machine carries a gun of a slightly smaller caliber. It's the 76mm 3K cannon, which also has German roots, by the way. At the first glance, the German gun looks like a better pick, and it actually is a bit better at penetrating armor. At 100 meters, it blasts through additional 10 millimeters of armor. Reload rate and turn rate are the same. 5 seconds and 11 degrees per second. What about depression and elevation? Virtually the same. From minus 3 to 82 degrees on the Soviet truck, and from minus 3 degrees to 85 on the German one. There is some noticeable difference when it comes to driving around, though. The Soviet chassis is a 10-wheeled Jag-10, not the best pick for driving off-road. An average speed of 19 kph struggles when going uphill, but you'll get more than a reasonable 25 to 30 kph on any proper road. The Flak 37 SFL is a half-track which allows it to get up to 29 kph even off-road. Going uphill is still a pain, though. Why can't all maps be flat, for heaven's sake? Enough figures and data. Let's talk tactics. The first thing to remember is that even though you're supposed to hunt enemy aircraft, you'll be the hunted and not the hunter in most cases. Counterintuitive, we know. You can dodge an artillery strike, and most tanks won't be able to one-shot you. Planes, though, avoid them like the plague. If you hear the sound of their engines, get to cover. Get to cover fast. Second, as you don't have speed or protection, you have to be extra careful when choosing avenues of approach and your sniping spots. It is crucial that you know maps, every nook and cranny, like the palm of your own hand. And if you pick a right spot, oh boy, you're a one-man army. Just remember, never, we repeat, never be the first to enter the fray. Wait for others to exchange shots, and then start wreaking havoc. If you drive the 29K, it might be a good idea to only expose your rear to the enemy. The truck cockpit would mess with your aiming and gun movement anyway. And this way, your driver has slightly better chances of survival. Which means that you'll be able to disengage if needed. But in most cases, both vehicles benefit from showing your side, or more precisely, only your gun. This way, 
you can fully benefit from your gun depression and elevation and hide quickly if being shot at. There's another nice thing to consider. Remember when we said that most tanks won't be able to one-shot you? That's because most shells simply won't explode when hitting your almost non-existent armor. And you get six crew members. <laughs> Might live a really long life, actually. One last thing. At this BR, most tankers won't take you seriously. And thus, you won't be their primary target. Especially if there are other allied tanks nearby. <laughs> their mistake. Punish them with impunity. You asked for it, and we deliver. Let's speak about a French jet fighter, which everyone deemed a success, except for its own creator. French pilots love the MD-450 Ouragan. It was their first full-fledged domestic jet fighter that immediately made France one of the world leaders in aviation. But while both top officials and generals, both industry insiders and general public, both radio and press sung songs of high praise, its designer, Marcel Dassault, wasn't happy at all. On the contrary, he knew too well that the Uragan was just a first small step towards greatness. The US and the Soviets already had their MiG-15s and their F-86 Sabres. In the UK, Sir Sidney Cam was already working on his own plane of the same type. That's why even before the Uragan properly hit the production lines, Dassault and his engineering team started to experiment on the design trying to outfit their new aircraft with a 30-degree swept wing. That's when the French bureaucrats made their entrance, as they are wont to do, demanding that the new aircraft should be equipped with the experimental French SNE CMA Attar 101 turbojet, and not the British Rolls-Royce Neen. The Attar 101 had a smaller diameter and an axial flow compressor, but it was less reliable and produced less power. Marcel Dassault lived through an era of large-scale nationalization of aviation industry before the war, and therefore knew too well what happens when you meekly do the bidding of paper pushers. That's why he refused to comply. You want us to use a French engine? Okay, we'll do it but only and only after it can at least match the British one in terms of performance. The designer didn't only fight any attempts to set any kind of expected flight characteristics for his new project, but also refused to physically let any bureaucrats into his offices, almost as if he wanted to rub some salt into their wounds. He also called the new fighter Mystère, a mystery. Oddly enough, Everything went according to Dassault's plan. The experimental Mystère 1 was basically an Uragan with a new wing. After that, it took the team almost no time to design and assemble the MD-452 Mystère 2A, with a longer fuselage and modified tail surfaces. It used the British engine, the Rolls-Royce Tay turbojet, which was a heavily modified and up-tiered Neen, Oh boy, did that make the people behind the SNE CMA engine livid. They literally went all in upgrading and modifying their Atar 101. But while they were figuring out the secrets of an afterburner, the Dassault's team churned out yet another version of the plane, the Mystère 2B, which traded the four 20mm guns for two 30mm DEFA cannons. Around this time, French engine makers finally finished working out the kinks of the Attar 101F, and thus the Mystère 2C was born. Basically, what happened was that by taking a tough stance, Marcel Dassault propelled both French aviation and aviation engine industries to the next level. 
while also showing the world how one can deal with the bureaucracy. The result? New contracts, a shower of praise, fame, love letters from pilots and politicians alike. But if you think that was enough for Dassault, you're wrong. For him, it was just the second step. The Mystère II became the first French aircraft to break Mach 1 in controlled flight, in a dive. The French created their first axial flow jet engine, and Armée de l'Air got a new multi-purpose combat aircraft. But all of that was not enough. France needed to get a new machine that would not only allow it to catch up with the big boys, the US and the USSR, but surpass them. But that's a story for another time. All fans of Japanese vehicles are in for a real treat very soon. The glorious Type 90 is coming. The next section is for those of you who can't wait to own this beast. A lot of War Thunder players were originally intimidated by the Japanese tech tree. It's only understandable as the tree didn't have a lot of indisputably badass vehicles, and the ones that were there were fairly unique and required people to change their habits. In the end, only a few players made it to the Type 74. If you're one of the players that got stuck somewhere in the middle of the tree, or in the very start of it, but would really want to get the new shiny Type 90, there's only one fast and reliable way to climb the tech tree, with the help of premium vehicles. But which one should you take? Let's see. There are five premium machines in the Japanese lineup, including both tanks and SPGs. They're so different, both in terms of their BR and their capabilities that even the pickiest tanker would find something to match his or her taste. Let's start with Rank 1 and BR 1.0. Here, we find the Type 95 Hago Commander, a typical first-era vehicle. We won't blabber too much about its fighting capabilities, it's just a decent pick for arcade that will make it that much easier to get to Rank 2, or even Rank 3 tanks. Next up is the heavy, multi-turreted Type 95 Rogo heavy tank. It has a slightly higher BR, 1.3, and you'll have to be much more careful with this one. Yeah, you have your main gun with 70mm HE shells and the secondary gun with 37mm AP rounds. But that's not what we call a fast vehicle. Main guns fire at different trajectories and are hard to use at long range. On the other hand, its shells are capable of literally tearing enemy vehicles apart, which is always nice. You'll have to go through Rank 2 vehicles on your own, but on Rank 3, there are two great surprises waiting for you. Let's start with the Type 3 Chinu medium tank that sits at BR 3.3. This is a monster, we're telling you. Just look at its 75mm gun. Even jumbos are fair game when you have a cannon like that. Other tanks? Even easier eliminations for this little tank. The only thing it lacks is serious armor. But that's when the second premium of this era comes into play. Welcome the Heavy Tank Number 6. Okay, just call it the Japanese Tiger. It's more or less the Tiger H1 that we all know and love, only with no smokes and a different commander's cupola. Let's move to rank 4. That's where you get the last Japanese premium that is currently available. This is the Type 5 Hori prototype tank destroyer. To put it bluntly, this is a monster conceived in hell. Its design might remind you of the formidable German Ferdinand, and rightly so, there are some similarities. But the Japanese vehicle is better in almost every aspect. No, seriously, it's faster, 
It has a 105mm gun instead of an 88mm one. Even comes with better armor. Of course, it's not enough to make it into a heavy tank. But if you know what you're doing while angling, your enemies won't have an easy time trying to get you. What about firepower, you ask? There are only two types of shells, true, but each of them penetrates 200 millimeters of steel. More than enough for playing comfortably. Not sure yet? It also takes only 8.6 seconds to reload, and the whole re can move at a speed of 34 kph off-road. All in all, that's a great tank destroyer that can wreck even the heaviest of targets, while also surviving enemy hits from time to time. You won't be able to ambush anyone in that thing, it's way too bulky for that, but orchestrating breakthroughs and holding positions are your jam. So why are you waiting? Get a vehicle you like and climb that tree. The Type 90 is waiting. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. The first question was asked by a user called The Scottish Koala. Hi Gaijin, can we expect to see more Australian vehicles in game? Hi mate, yeah, it might happen. There are quite a few interesting machines out there. We won't promise much, but keep your eyes peeled. Joseph Kovach asks, My school just started a gaming club and we are wondering would you guys at Gaijin be willing to sponsor us if we gain over 100,000 followers? War Thunder is going to be one of the games we play a lot and want to know what you think about it? Hi, Joseph. Man, a hundred thousand is a lot. Are you sure you can make it? Anyhow, take a look at our sponsorship requirements and deals at our site. You actually don't need that many followers to become a partner. Best of luck to you. We really appreciate it. Then there is a question from a user called Gurika D. Will we ever be able to choose a tracer color? Why would you want that? The color of traces actually gives you valuable information as different colors are associated with different guns and nations. If you really, really, really want something fancy, well, there is always CDK. And the last, very serious message was sent by a player called Tristan Storaun. Do you have one guy you lock in the basement and force him to scroll through all the comments? No, certainly not. How did you even think of that? In short, no. Move along, citizen. Nothing to see here. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on The Shooting Range. <laughs>